Arirang Special. Agriculture is at the forefront and is the backbone of Kenya's economy. Two-thirds of Kenyans depend on the crops they grow and the animals they keep for their livelihoods and survival. In 2005, agriculture, including forestry and fishing, accounted for about 24% of Kenya's gross domestic product GDP, as well as for 18% of wage employment and 50% of revenue from exports. Tonight on The Entrepreneur, our focus is on agribusiness. Agribusiness is commercialized farming which uses advanced technology. We feature the unique stories of Miss Rosemary Odinga, a snail farmer, and Doris Masharia, an ornamental fish farmer. To the public domain, Rosemary Odinga is seen as a promising politician keen on following the steps of her father, Raila Amolo Odinga. This is evident from her endless efforts in spearheading youth campaigns to transform their lives. However, there is another side to this aspiring politician. Today, we meet her at Jaramogi Odinga Oginga Foundation along Kiambere Road in Nairobi, doing what she loves most. She has set up one of her five greenhouses in what is arguably one of the most unique and budding ventures, snail farming. She ventured into snail farming in 2007 following advice from a former African president. I visited the snail farm in Nigeria. Um, uh, it was for the former president, Obasanjo, who was doing snail farming. He asked me if I'm interested in farming and I said no. He said, I'm a city girl, born in the city and raised in the city. Uh, but when, before I left, he said, you should think about farming. And so when I came back, I said, Okay, let me think about it. Let me research. Let me try. She did intense research on the venture, visited the University of Nairobi, and met the late Professor Musombi, a snail expert who made this dream come true. I started it off as an experiment. I wanted to see if it's something that um, was hard to do, if it was easy to do, and um, just to see how... I was curious. That's how I started it. I started off out of curiosity. Rosemary learned everything from the type of snails, their behavior, ideal environment, feeding, breeding, market potential, among many. The particular species we have here in East Africa is called Akatina fulica. It's different from the one in West Africa. They have Akatina akatina, Akatina magnata. Those ones grow very big. Akatina fulica are prolific breeders. They lay between 200 to 500 eggs twice a year. That means one snail can lay uh, at the end of the year between 400 to 1,000 eggs. She started off with 13 giant African land snails. The beginning though was disheartening. And of all those 13 snails, only two survived. Yes, it was a bit disheartening but we kept on and then those two laid eggs. And when we saw the eggs, we were so excited. We were like, oh, we have eggs. And that is how the snail project just generated. And snails are hermaphrodites, which means they have both male and female organs. Either one of them can lay eggs for you. After correcting her mistakes and not losing hope, to date, the two remaining breeders have multiplied. She currently has more than 3,000 snails at various stages of their life. Snails are not big. They are very small. Anyone can handle them. Even a small child can handle them. Then they also don't make noise. <laughs> uh, they don't uh, have a nasty smell. Their care is very simple, but it makes, needs someone who's very patient and very observant. To ensure that snails blossom, there are certain aspects that a farmer must get right. One is temperature regulation, correct soil type that is treated and contains nutrients snails need. You have to treat the soil, 
uh, by treating, you know, you check for impurities, you check for other organisms that are inside the soil to be able to regulate the temperature. This greenhouse and this particular uh, lining that we used protects it from the sun because again, if it's too hot, they burn and they don't like to burn. And then also the trees in the area are very important because they provide a lot of oxygen and natural environment where we have um, open windows to the side. So when it's too hot, we can open the windows and then there's better flow of air and it's nice and cool. When it's too cold, in the evenings or in the month of June and July, we close them down again and therefore we keep the temperatures here warm. And uh, we have a sprinkler system. When it gets too hot, again, we turn on the sprinkler system to make sure that the place is nice and humid. When rearing snails, you have to be careful of the location that you are, the type of housing that you use, what you feed the snails. You have to be careful of, of the predators, for example, rats, snakes. To rare snails, one has to obtain a license from Kenya Wildlife Service because the creatures are categorized as wild. You have to be very careful about their security. For example, here we developed a system where you have a, a, this particular uh, polythene that you cover the snails and then that way they don't escape. Even the type of bucket we used was something that we had to figure out and then the depth of the soil that we well, it has to be deep enough for them to be able to burrow inside. She also brought on board three farmhands to help with the extra workload. Now what we're spraying is just water. As a routine, she cleans them using water in spray bottles, then categorizes them in different containers. Each particular greenhouse, I have about uh, between two and three persons who manage the greenhouse and we usually do it in shifts, morning shift and evening shift, so that we make sure that the place is constantly kept very clean because snails can be very sensitive to the slightest change in temperature, slightest change in um, environment. The creatures feed on vitamins. Their diet comprises of kales, cabbages and fruits like popo. We have over a hundred breeders, almost 200 breeders right now. And uh, sometimes we, depending on what we're looking for, either increase the breeders or we reduce the number of breeders. This greenhouse alone contains more than 1,000 basins, each with numerous snails in different stages. And after it lays eggs, we wait a little bit, a couple of days, and then you'll see little hatchlings coming out of the shell. And then uh, we observe those hatchlings after a certain period we will separate them. And after separation, we will, like you see, um, trying to find over here. This one, I think, is the reproduction organ. So this one is almost ready to, to, to reproduce. And then for us, we wait about four, four months. And after four months now, the hatched snails are ready and ready to go to market. It started off as a, as a as a hobby but you see the way they have such prolific breeders and um, because of that we started having more snails than we could consume ourselves so I started reaching out to people that I thought would be interested in it I reached out to some people in the Nigerian Embassy the Ghanaian consulate uh, I talked to a few uh, Chinese restaurants and um, also the French restaurant and they were interested so now they, from there, that's now how we learned how to do the deshelling process and how to package them and what size goes for what market. Different markets like different uh, sizes. Um, the West African market like them very, very big. And then the European market like them when they're about this size. So this takes about four months <coughs> before it reaches that size and ready for eating. They are packed in 80 and 160 gram vacuum sealed bags containing 12 and 24 pieces respectively. So for us we break our markets into uh, three different areas. There is the West African uh, market, these are people from Nigeria and from Ghana. Then we have the European market, uh, these are some French people and Dutch. And then we have the Asian market which are um, the Chinese uh, expatriates. But for most part it's the expatriate market. 
that uh, take our, our snails in, individuals from the expanded markets. They are stored in low temperature below 10 degrees ready for the market. We are not able to meet the demand for our snail uh, consumption by the expanded market in the country. So once you're able to, but there's potential for snail farming to have export because in West Africa they export their snails to uh, France and to China. They have about five greenhouses, but there is potential for them to even be much, much bigger. If you look at um, countries such as Australia and uh, France, snails are grown in acres and acres. And that is because they have the potential and that is because they have the ready market for the snail farm. Snail meat is tantalizing and super nutritious. It tastes like fried gizzard dipped in butter. When I first started snail farming, a lot of people thought that I was very crazy. And then they wondered, what are you doing with, with snails? And I kept to it and I said, you know what, I see a future in snail farming. I see it being something different. I see it being something that can be inspiring for other people, not only to try snail farming, but to try any other form of farming. I was thinking about food security. I was thinking about um, jobs. I was thinking about uh, things that are not so difficult to do, that anybody can do. And so the future of snail farming for me is very bright because I have seen this potential in the market. And I've also seen a lot of curiosity, not just by um, foreigners, but also locals. I think that uh, anybody who has an idea, uh, stick to your idea, be true, be patient, and keep to your passion. And that's the only way we will be able to grow our country, Kenya. It has high demand from the high-end market. Her clientele comprise high-end hotels, individual clients including expatriates, Kenyans of foreign origin and upmarket restaurants. Rosemary attests that entrepreneurship in agribusiness holds the key to the future of Kenya and believes engaging in farming is a sign of patriotism because it's a contribution towards food security. This week, we look at women who have made a difference in the society. Women who took the risk and delved into territories that were once seen as male-dominated. Sumaya Athman is one such woman. She is the CEO of the National Oil Corporation. Born in the coastal region of Mombasa, Sumaya was lucky to have parents who were keen on education and thus avoided the Swahili culture of early marriages. She managed to get equal access to education just like the boys in her family, something that was not very popular in her community since boys were given priority of education. They would push us, you know, you finish one level, they would no, go for the next. You finish your first degree, go for your master's, you know. So they were always pushing to ensure that, no, no, keep learning, keep studying. Um, right now, things have uh, improved tremendously, even within our communities. We see the number of girls who are actually studying, um, you know, to different levels, higher levels of education, very many different fields has really grown significantly. Mm -hmm. So I think that, that is something that definitely has uh, happened within the community. Samaya completed her O-levels at Kenya High School and acquired a degree in law at the University of Nairobi. And then I got an opportunity to finish it in the UK at the University of Lancaster. And then I went to University of Bristol to do my master's. Um, thereafter, I came back home. I went to the Kenya School of Law. I got my diploma in law. And at some point, you know, during my working, um, working life, I got an opportunity to go to Oxford to do um, advanced management studies. So I went there to, uh, to study that. Um, and other than that, it's been maybe short, very short courses, mm -hmm. uh, geared perhaps specifically to the industry that I am in, you know, oil and gas, or governance as well. I've done um, a fair bit on uh, training 
in governance and I am actually a certified governance trainer, so I train in governance. After graduation, Sumaya joined the private sector and worked as a lawyer. However, that was short-lived as she one day came across a position advertised in the local dailies by the National Oil Corporation and applied. They were looking for somebody to head their legal department. I'd never heard of National Oil Corporation before. But I said, okay, here is my chance to walk the talk and apply, which I did. They offered me the position. And then when I started the work, I realized I'm enjoying actually the business aspects of the work. And I um, started handling strategy as well. They then um, added corporate affairs to my docket. So I was doing legal strategy and corporate affairs. Eventually, the board appointed me as the deputy managing director. And um, at, the, at the expiry of the contract of the then MD, mm -hmm. I was appointed, I, well, I wasn't appointed, I applied. It was a competitive process. Mm -hmm. So I applied for the position of the MD, and that's how I, I got the position. Being a woman, delving in what was seen as a male-dominated industry was not easy. Sumaya encountered several challenges in her application to head the giant oil company. You know, people don't expect uh, a female and maybe a young woman young woman in hijab, you know, you can keep adding to the list to yes. apply for that type of a position. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, some people have preset ideas on how they want the process to go. Uh, and um, and uh, so it, was, it wasn't a straightforward process. Actually, you know, we did it several times before eventually, you know, the, the process was concluded. Mm -hmm. So I think for a woman, um, you know, your challenges start not even after you're in the door, but even trying to get through the door, you know, you're faced with, with all sorts of um, obstacles being, uh, you know, thrown your way. Yes. She was determined to get the position and nothing could stop her. She eventually got it. But being a woman boss came with its own challenges as well. You know, when you're dealing with professionals, mm -hmm. they take you as a professional. Mm -hmm. So they'll give you an opportunity to prove yourself. Can yes. you do it? Mm -hmm. And once you show that you can, you know, they're happy to deal with you as a professional. They will give you the, the type of um, uh, space that they would give to another professional. But uh, unfortunately, you don't always deal with professionals. Yes. So you meet all sorts of people who are there for their own objectives. Mm -hmm. A lot of them are really there for their own personal objectives. <clears throat> you know, and I'm not talking about within the company only. I mean, these are people you'll meet with outside different stakeholders mm -hmm. who are only there for their own personal interest. And, you know, the minute they think, um, you know, you are there, you know, for focused on doing your work, you know, they, they know they are not going to get through some of the things they want, then they put a lot of pressure. Whether it's direct pressure on you, whether it's political pressure, whether it's, you know, all sorts of funny pressures. Yes. Um, so you will deal with that. You'll deal with the fact that, um, that uh, you know, men do have a different style of working from women. Mm -hmm. So, and not everyone understands that. So whereas it is a strength, I think both genders have a lot to learn from each other yes. to help build you know, a cohesive team. There are people who don't understand that. So in the current day and age, your workforce, Generation Y, Generation Z, Millennials, the people coming in are very young. They are very mobile, they are very fast. So you have to be able to relate to that generation. If you can do that, mm -hmm. you know, you'll not be able to, to bring, help bring the best out of your staff. Yes. you know enable them to give you their discretionary effort but there are people who don't understand that being a woman leader makes one more passionate about certain issues affecting women sexual harassment at the office is something that has cost many companies good employees what we have done for instance within the organization is to have a very um, well-established policy and talk about it and you know so that people are aware this is not okay and even in other forum where we do meet say at the ceo level there was a forum that we met we specifically highlighted this issue because sometimes people don't realize that it is a real issue that women do face mm -hmm. and i guess increasingly men face it as well but unless people talk about it it's you know hushed 
and then it creates a very difficult uh, working environment. So I think having a very robust policy mm -hmm. and having an open approach to it that, listen, if you do have an issue, you know, talk about it is very important. Balancing family life and a career is a major concern for many women and Sumaya is no different. One of the things that uh, I realized is that you need to prioritize and prioritizing is not only in the workplace, it's also outside. So even with my family, for me, I don't delegate family. They have very high priority, which means if they are family occasions, if my children have functions in school, I want to be there myself. You know, it's not one of those things that I say, oh, I'm too busy to attend. To the extent possible, mm -hmm. I prioritize that because, you know, at the end of the day, your children grow up and they leave and you lose such an important time. She has been at the National Oil since 2007 and is a member of the Association of International Petroleum Negotiators. She also sits in the National Fossil Fuel Advisory Committee and the National Fossil Fuels Training Subcommittee. My advice is uh, be very focused on your values. Be clear what those values are and be very, very focused on them. You'll meet a lot of people who want to challenge your values. They want to tell you, oh, are you the only one wanting to walk a straight line? Everybody else is doing A, B, C, D. They want to try and compromise you. You know, they want to just break rules and regulations and do all sorts of funny things. And they want to pressurize you to join them. So you being a value-based uh, a person, I think is extremely critical because at the end of the day you'll face all sorts of challenges. At the Nairobi County Council, Masi Kamau is the Minister for Public Service Management. This woman has a lot on her plate, making sure that her over 4 million clients who live in Nairobi County get exceptional service from her 12,000 employees who are nowhere near half the number of her clients. However, as a woman leader, she has learned to isolate emotions from competition. My role is to keep the 12,000 workers engaged, motivated, and um, focused in high performance uh, work ethics. It's not been easy because uh, of various challenges. Uh, one is uh, settling them down following the devolution. Uh, because devolution collapsed what was existing before known as uh, Nairobi City County or Nairobi City Council, sorry. Uh, the City Council of Nairobi, which was then under the Ministry of Local Authorities. Devolution then also brought uh, the 14 services in the constitution and with them devolved staff from national government, an addition of about 5,000. During this transition, as we transited from um, local authority city council, we had the transitional authority which also had uh, members of staff within the government, uh, Nairobi government. And um, since we came on board, we also have an entity called County Public Service Board, which had to fill the positions within the County Government Act, uh, new positions uh, like sub-county administration. So that meant that in our basket of Nairobi government, mm -hmm. we have probably like four divisions of members of staff, but trying to work together. Yes. And that has been the primary challenge to integrate them to think as one yes. so that we can be able to have flawless service delivery in Nairobi. Ms. Kamau says that a woman should not expect sympathy, pity, or to be given a helping hand at work because of her gender. These are the character traits that make women not succeed. Uh, I think the challenge of most women leaders is where we, the, the, there is blurring between emotional reactions to situations. I have had to undergo training, mentorship on emotional intelligence. I've had to understand myself, get into self-awareness as a woman, what makes me, what is my makeup emotionally as a woman and how does that or 
can how how can I, that enhance me yes. or destroy me? Yes. So I very clear in my head that uh, resorts always downplay emotional games. Yes. But as a woman, if you're told to do something and you don't do it, and then you expect sympathy or pity or to be given a helping hand because you're a woman, yes. then you lose the game. Competition is healthy and Kamau takes her male counterparts as worthy opponents towards achieving her success. When you lead, uh, be very calm and sober about it. But there is nothing wrong in realizing that first you're a woman. And therefore once you know first you're a woman, then you know the challenges you're likely to face because of your makeup, emotional makeup. And therefore by the time you come to lead, first deal with yourself so that you're able to come and lead. But if you don't deal with yourself as a woman, when you come to lead, then you'll drag in uh, your womanhood yes. into the whole situation. And that is the way it is. And remember, men have had an advantage in that they've been in the workplaces far longer than us. So they are bound to, be, to have better ways or more subtle ways of overcoming you. So you need to do your homework every day. You need to learn every day. Every day you need to learn. Every day you need to embrace change mm. so that you can be able to be on the same platform with our male counterparts. We've also decided to make union. Ms. Kamau's team convene meetings every morning to see how they can improve service delivery to Nairobi residents. The Nairobi County government inherited numerous problems from its predecessors, the City Council. We inherited uh, an, an institution that didn't even have uh, tools mm -hmm. to do work. Uh, if, for instance, it is, if it is garbage collection, we found a situation where we didn't have enough garbage collection vehicles. Yes. We've had to manage the scarce resources such that we buy uh, the lorries, we buy the sweeping instruments, and so on and so forth. So it's been really a big challenge for the leadership of this county, mm -hmm. but it has also made us learn. It has been a very steep learning curve. Yes. We've learned how to try and perform in luck. And this culture change that I'm talking about is supposed to help all the workers mm -hmm. to integrate and internalize how to deal with these challenges of serving Nairobians despite the challenges that we are facing. Kamau says the county government is trying to change the mindset of its employees so that they can continue to serve Nairobians despite the many challenges they face. With such a huge workforce, then you are faced with the issue of paying them. The wage bill in Nairobi City County government has been enormous. The burden of paying these um, uh, good workers of Nairobi City County government costs us approximately 1.5 billion shillings every month. And uh, from the resources that we get from our revenue collection and from the national government, mm -hmm. uh, in total, probably from national government, we get like 11 billion. And from our revenue collection, we get maybe about uh, 8 billion uh, to 9 billion. A total of probably about 20 billion and you have a workforce that you're paying 1.5 billion every month, you do the maths yeah. a year, that comes to uh, approximately 15 billion shillings or thereabout. Okay. So then you are left now with a very little amount of money to focus on development projects. Many Nairobians have a negative perception on council workers. Many believe that the council workers are out to harass or extort them. We want to change the face of the city Ascari, where the city Ascari has been seen as an instrument of brutality. Yeah. Uh, and we want our city Ascari to be seen as an instrument of service yes. to Nairobians. Uh, but another challenge that we have that faces our workers day to day is the attitude also that has been prevailing with the Nairobians themselves. Yes. Nairobians the way they talk on social media about NCCG, it's like they have written us off. They look at our workers mm -hmm. and they discredit them. Yes. And you know all human beings, if you tell a human being he's useless, he's an unperformer, 
that is exactly what he'll give you. So part of my culture change challenge is to appeal and to persuade Nairobians. Number one, to be patient. Number two, to work with this city, with this institution in trying to help us to serve them. Kamau's education background is quite impressive. She has a master's in law and master's in diplomacy and international relations. She is a trained lawyer and advocate of the High Court and before joining the county government, she ran a Kagwe Kamau and Karanja law firm. She also worked in the banking industry. Kamau is currently pursuing a PhD in human resource management. Najma Ismail for All Women.